it's truly an honor to be um, asked back this year. And I really um, appreciate the opportunity to share uh, what's going on in the nutrition front with everyone. And we hear enough um, you know, for new information from the surgeons to remove the tumors and then our oncologists to, uh, as to how to kill the cancer. And I'm gonna talk about actually how to support your body to go through all the treatment and also to prevent the cancer from start with or uh, from recurrent. That would be my goal today. So I'm just talking about generally, particularly gastrointestinal cancer, such as pancreatic cancer, is, is particularly associated with the challenges I'm just listed here. And when also our loved ones try to help, they kind of present everything under the sun, uh, hoping we can eat the whole table or whole refrigerator. And that is just the increase the challenges we are facing. And there are a lot of times, even patients tell me they really feel guilty, not able to do that, and make their families even more concerned. So in the, in, uh, actually in 1990s even, we were really have one goal, one goal only for nutrition support, and that is for the patient to maintain weight, or more so gaining weight. And there are times we tell people to eat half gallon ice creams, eat peanut butter all the day long, and try to just achieve that. So today, actually from a nutrition point of view, we have learned quite a bit. <clears throat> so what is truly the goal for nutrition support? The goal actually it is not necessarily gain weight, it is maintain the weight or maintain your function or improve your life. Why we're no longer emphasizing weight gain? Actually, we learned, particularly in a disease condition, when you are gaining weight, you predominantly gaining fat. And fat is not necessarily always helpful, and particularly when we're dealing with illness such as cancer. And there has been limited study, but it starts to uh, learn more and more calorie restrictions or in uh, low degree of weight loss, maybe is the body's way try to slow down everything, including the tumor. But this is not the same as to say you lose 20, 30 pounds. And definitely it's suggestive we don't have to worry about if we're not gaining weight. So now, to achieve the goal of maintaining weight or not to lose uh, too much weight, and what we got to do. So here's uh, what um, we can based on the science we know today. And here are the nutrition categories. We know the macronutrients, they are the carbohydrate, the fat, and the proteins. And we know the micronutrients, vitamins, minerals. And also there's a new class of phytonutrients, and that is uh, relatively new to all of us. I'm actually gonna even talk about something even newer about microbiomes, how they relate to nutrition and related to your cancer. The most important nutrition we really need to pay attention to actually is protein. Protein is our body's building block that including our immune system. And we really need to take adequate amount to make sure our body is having enough material to repair, to fight the cancer and uh, support our daily functions. And what are the best source of proteins? Uh, how much we need? About 20 grams each meal. That will be kind of the min minimum to start. How much is 20 grams? How about three ounces of meat? How much is three ounces of meat? A deck of card size? So each meal, we should try to start with the protein about a decacard of size. And that would be the minimum and we should have. If you could, if you're talking about where the protein should come from, and the best would be some from the animal source and some from the uh, veggie source. So what are they? So here are a few examples. And talking about 
protein not only high quality, but also easy to digest and not really provoking all the challenges we already have from having the cancer. Here are the top ones. Number one, we see there's um, chicken breast and there's a, uh, seafood, and there's a turkey breast, part of also because they have uh, much less um, saturated fat, and they also um, has more higher cro uh, protein, a higher amount of a protein. On top of that, there's eggs, including the yolk, and there isn't anything wrong, particularly your body is under major stress to take whole eggs. That is one thing we're learning more and more, including it is included in the new dietary guidelines published in December 2015. If we talk about protein source, there is soybeans, and there are now a lot of uh, other products uh, such as CVs and many uh, heaps and you know quinoa. A lot of them uh, protein uh, from the plant, but they are also a very good, rich source uh, for our body. Lastly, I also want to talk about purified protein supplement, protein powders. In particular, I'm talk oh here's um, particularly talking about whey protein. Whey protein it is a is a uh, name for a collect group of proteins that is dissolved in milk. They can be absor uh, absorbed easily. They also have special features, such as have a higher concentration or fraction of branched-chain amino acid. So what is special about branched-chain amino acid? And it turned out to be they not only serves as building blocks for your body, but they also functioning as hormones to stimulate protein synthesis, particularly in your muscles. So for that purpose, it has been uh, used widely in bodybuilders to start with, now to um, patients with chronic conditions, elderly, and even young children. And also talking about it is very easy to prepare. You really can make it clean. Instead of you have to go to a restaurant to eat, you don't know what they put it in. You can easily start with 100% pure whey protein, as simple as add water to it. If you like a flavor, add you know uh, fruit to it, and make a shake, and you can sip it through uh, your day. If that is not even tolerable, you just have that much nausea. You can even make a protein popsicles to really leaking on to give your body the minimal amount of protein you would need. It is very effective and most people would tolerate the protein popsicles. We've been working with many of you during therapy or treatment in particular to really get minimal support of nutrition. So now we're talking about fat. It's not true all the fat is bad. And but it depends on what type we're talking about. And saturated fat, as I listed on the top, mostly from animal proteins. And in this case of pancreatic cancer, it's much harder to digest because the fat actually require a lot more from the pancreatic enzymes. So also, we hear a lot of things about they're not healthy and you know, we should not have really too much, particularly not challenge ourselves when we already have other challenges. But other fat actually are essential to our body and easily absorbable and tolerated, such as monounsaturated fatty acid, meaning they only have one double bonds in the whole fat chain. There's a list of nuts, all the tree nuts we can think about, avocados, and there's your uh, humps, and there's also your olive oil. They are all very rich source 
from one unsaturated fatty acid. And then also the polyunsaturated and particularly omega-3 or fish oil, and that has been having evidence to not only help you stay healthy and help your uh, body to actually fighting cancer, even in an ad adjuvant uh, mood. So that is omega-3. Uh, omega For those of you vegetarians, now we do have reliable vegetarian source of omega-3, that is DHA. That is from the algae directly, not going uh, through the fish. Fish do not make omega-3s. Fish just concentrators. They are just eating the algae, make it concentrated, and uh, make it more deliverable to us. For those of you taking flax seed as a source of omega-3, that is not efficient. At the best, you convert 5% of what is in the flax seed to really to long chain uh, omega-3 fatty acid. That's what our body really need. And the last uh, macronutrient group is the carbohydrate. We do need a carbohydrate uh, for energies. Those are the most popular source in the US and we should have it because we need the energy, but we shouldn't have too much. So where the carbohydrate truly should come from? And this is the best source, it is how humans has been evolved on, and the best match our genetics. There's a couple reasons beyond it provides us energy. That is, it's a rich source of vitamins, and they may be much more functional than the vitamin pills you take. And there's also rich source of minerals, including trees minerals. And there's also phytonutrients, I'm going to go through what they are. And they also we all know fibers. Lastly, they are the best prebiotics to grow in your own garden. We'll talk about that as well. So the reason the fruit and vegetable have different colors is truly because they have different nutrients in it. Every plant evolved on their own survival, not for the purpose of they just grow for human consumptions. During all the years of evolution, each plant develops its own way to deal the oxygen damage, the free radicals damage. So they have its own antioxidant system. And in our body though, it is not true we can just eat blueberries all day long and we're getting more and more benefit. And each system get to a plateau at a certain point. So the best approach to get all well, like a human should be on the top of the food chain to get all sort of vegetables. Not only just uh, raw, but also cooked. I'll give you an example of that. For example, lycopene, as you see here, gave the red color of tomatoes and watermelons and even uh, red bell peppers. But lycopene is not really available to us unless we cook it. But that's not a much issue in the U.S. because most of the tomatoes are consumed in tomato sauce, tomato, tomato juice. They're all cooked. You, when you eat raw, there's nothing wrong to give you other nutrients, but not particularly lycopene. And looking at beta carotene is another example. You know, um, it actually uh, has gave you the orange color and to most of the plants. And it also have better availability um, when you when you cook them. And that's a second example. So look at the yellow, the yellow color actually is co mostly come flavonoids. And even getting darker, like your the favorite chocolate, and they are all in this families as to chemical compounds classification. Now, it comes to the group we know the most, and that is the reason we drink the wine every day, and we have plenty of excuses to do that, and we eat blueberries every day. I just want to remind everyone, we are human beings, we're not a blueberry. You can't get everything from your blueberry, all right? And also another thing is true, if you're gonna have a whole bowl of ice cream, uh, ice cream and put five blueberry on it, it is still ice cream, all right? <laughs> it is not a blueberry. And as to those of you who love wine, and if you, if you really enjoy it, 
and the wine relax you and give you a much relaxed night and go ahead and enjoy it. If you want to drink for the purpose of, you know, the benefit for risk virtual, you need not one bottle, not 10 bottles, more than that every day to get to the dose we have used to study in the mouse, okay, in the animals. And we definitely not mouse. So uh, the other group actually, you know, it is a spice mostly. Um, they actually mostly have one um, compound in common. It's called allium. This is usually the white color come along. And the truth is, if you're talking about antioxidant capacities, the strongest antioxidant it's not necessarily what you think about blueberry, um, blackberry. If you look, took, looking at top 10, spice families take the, uh, at least six or seven out of the top 10 list. There are very strong antioxidants, including the um, few I'm showing here, the, the garlic, the onions, and you know, uh, the leeks, and also other black peppers. We actually study that, and I'll go, f I'll go through a few, give you examples. And also fruit, this is an example to share with everyone. Fruit actually, again, imbued everything around themselves. And pomegranate like harsh weathers. They're Middle East, and they are also here in California in the valley. And all the nutrients we actually really discover is not necessarily in the arrows. Most of the nutrients actually is in the host. And when we do research, we offer everyone free pomegranate as long as you retain the peels back to us. So when, now they learn that when they make a juice, they actually don't just do anything but squeeze the entire fruit to get the nutrients out of it. There's one special nutrient in pomegranate. It is called elagic tannins. It's kind of complex compound. The red guy is called elagic acid. That has been having uh, studies shown at least in vitro is strongly inhibit uh, pancreatic cancer growth. So I'm just giving you one example of that. The other one belongs to a spice family. It is curcumin. That's the yellow color you um, see when you eat Indian food. That's the golden color. It belongs to the turmeric family, and it has been uh, widely used about five, up to 5,000 years in India, China, and Far East. And I just want to show you two pictures to impress you. This is number one, to look at how much uh, effect curcumin has on all kind of a chronic medical conditions, including cancer. And the second picture is, is not only, you know, um, have impact on all those diseases, it also touches almost uh, every single mechanism we're studying in cell proliferation and cell metabolism. It has very profound effect, and this is also uh, now we, with modern technology, we understand why in uh, ancient times we actually not only eat that every day, but also use for medicinal purpose. And I think I have one example here is a phase two trial with curcumin um, to uh, treat advanced pancreatic cancer. I only want to point out one thing. 21 out of 25 patients in this small study and did respond to curcumin without much of significant side effects. So there are definitely more studies on the line. And there is a one group in Florida, um, they are actually have studies on this as well. The other one example is tea, and tea is around all the years. In California, we particularly like a green tea. Well, the truth is, the, the reason we have different name and different tea, it is all from the same tree leaves. The difference is that they're processed differently, and the m minimal process is white tea. Essentially, you harvest the leaves, steam it, dry it, there it is. 
Okay, green tea is a little bit more processed than that for preservation. And black tea is roasted and fermented and actually started with one purpose, that is shipping the tea from far east to the west. So you have to tolerate the couple months of uh, time or over the sea. And you know, on top of the antioxidants, our group actually has found out that it, the tea may have different uh, compounds along processing from green tea to become black tea, but the truth is all different compounds can still have the similar effect and may st uh, through different mechanism. And there has been a quite uh, wide uh, uh, interest looking at effect of tea on, on cancer. I'm just give you one example here. One compound called EGCG is shared pretty much in all teas is showing you effectively inhibit pancreatic cancer cell growth. Next one is some uh, is actually vitamin E. I put a different name there. It's called tocotrienol. Vitamin E actually have eight different iso, uh, we call isomer, different kind, very similar. And there are two major groups. One is called alpha uh, tocopherol, the other one, the other four are called tocotrienol. The difference is the tocotrienol has double bonds. It, is, uh, it exists in nature, but in very small amount. Tocotrienol, however, gives you most of the biological effect. Unfortunately, when you take a supplement, it is the cheapest form, tocopherol. And there has been studies showing when you take a vitamin E, you not only not having beneficial effect, it may give you negative effect. Why is that? One, at least one mechanism is believed to be when you take large quantity of the tocopherol, you actually compete with the naturally existing really effective form of vitamin E, you end up having less effective vitamin E get into your body. So tocotrienol is the one really doing the work and it can be from many different sources. I put it over there. And this is the one, again, like a curcumin, it had profound effect on the cell function. Normal cells, and uh, cancer cells. And there has been uh, many, many studies and to look at the effect on uh, cancer, including pancreatic cancer. So this is truly the vitamin E, and we should, if you're gonna take a supplement, to consider. And this is just give you one example in uh, look at the cell proliferation, what's the effect of tocotrienol. And the other point I want to um, um, you know, really bring up here is that we're talking about each of the individual, tocotrienols, curcumins, as its own. The truth is, and combine most of the fruit or vegetables, not only just have one, but they have combination mixtures. And we also know by study, look at it, and the combinations works better than any single one come along. Very much like a Dr. Lee's uh, cocktail uh, chemotherapy for tumor because they can hit a different target and work on different mechanism and also maybe um, really uh, neutralize some of the side effect from any individual one. So now I'm actually going to move on to talk about something become really active in the last five or ten years and that is a microbiome. What is a microbiome? Are all the, they include all the microbes on your body and in your body. How many of them? About at least 100 trillion to 300 trillion of them. All right, and I'll give you an example. So here's our own human cells. We are surrounded with a cloud, not exaggeration, and of bacteria, fungi, virus, uh, old microbes called archaea, and all kind of viruses. And t if you think about all those guys on you and inside you, they weigh about five pounds. You just cannot see them. 
we actually now calling this a new organ of our body we never know. One day in court, we may actually able to say, I did not kill the man, my microbes did, right? <laughs> And this is actually very um, important. You look at all the genetic materials on you and in you. Your, your human uh, genes is only about 23,000 genes. How many genetic material are all those microbes are yours? You're looking at over a million genes. All right, you're completely, in a sense, emerged in these clouds and some degree overwhelmed by the uh, crowd as well. But you cannot now just point fingers all the way from you. Who controls this um, whole cloud is you. All right. So there is actually once this, those microbes and not only deal with our body function, even dealing our mind. And this is one of the study done at UCLA, actually showing the microbes in your gut work with the endocrine cells in your leaning of your uh, gastrointestinal tract, and therefore and release serotonin. That's one of the neural uh, transmitters and controls your mood or regulates your mood. So. Those are the guys actually can't really decide you happy or not happy. Also, they de decide if you need antidepressant or not, I guess. So, and the other thing is even more fascinating. They just, this is just published a week ago, last week. Now we found the malnourished kids in Africa actually is not just purely because they don't have enough nutrition. It also because they have different bacteria in their gut, the lacking of some key ones for their growth. So here is how they did it. They have the kids fecal material and give to the males who were born uh, no germs, okay? They call germ free. What we can see here is, you know, if the males uh, get the uh, bacteria, the fecal material from a well-developed kids, it grows just fine. If you actually, the mouse get from the malnourished kids with retarded growth, the mouse behave exactly the same. So there is a very active messengers and being transmitted and just by fecal material. So this was just published in, you know, uh, last week. Now we have to ask ourselves, when we truly have issues with all the challenges, you know, nausea, poor appetite, is that truly just the tumor per se? Is actually the microbes change because of tumor or how we live, including how we eating? And there is also another active field related to pancreatic cancer in particular. That is, there have been study after study showing the bacteria living in your mouth, and actually what kind of they are, is closely associated with the risk of you developing pancreatic cancer. And this is a chart hard to read, but you look at all the one with the triangles. Those are the species you can tell they're different between uh, pancreatic cancer a patient versus healthy um, patients. So this is just a new field and is actively evolving and there is active research. Now you're talking about, okay now, and why don't we take some probiotics? When you take a probiotic, you're taking live bacteria. We think those are the one because the way we live, dietary change and other things are lacking off in our gut. So they're all live ones. So if you take a live ones, their issue come along. Number one, can they survive your stomach acid and your intestinal and digestive enzymes? Number two, and can they become alive again and more importantly, can they settle down in your gut to set up their own community? And those are actually uncertain answers still up to today. That's why if you think about, if any of you taking probiotics, it always says taking that many billion three times a day for the rest of your lives. With that have said, you know one thing for sure, they're not like a seas. Once they reach to your gut, they'll just set up, settle down, proliferate, get their own communities. In contrary to probiotics, there is prebiotics. 
Prebiotics is not a uh, semi-awake uh, bacteria, okay? And prebiotics actually is actually nutrients mostly from fibers. It's soluble fibers in particular, and also phenolic compounds also from plants, like from tea, from cocoa, and from pomegranate. And you can see that from the picture, it is widely uh, exists in our diet, and that actually explains, you know, our dietary change from plant-based now to starch-based um, actually promoted or increased our risk, not only for chronic diseases, but also cancer, including pancreatic cancer. So what are the differences of probiotics and prebiotics? Now, I'm actually showing you a cartoon. Prebiotics is more in a sense of how you're gonna uh, really want your garden to be like. You actually have your own um, bacteria, and but by using different fertilizers and uh, weed killers, you can have a good variety and restore the community. That is a prebiotics. What is a probiotics? Probiotics, you want to forcefully plant one flower, one flower only. It may or may not survive, it may or may not appropriate. So as you can see, the big flowers are right there. So that would be a conceptual um, uh, picture I try to give you to uh, explain what is probiotics, what is prebiotics as to the function. So come back to, we now know what we eat, essentially we're choosing a large, uh, in a degree, prebiotics, what should we eat? So here, number one, eat all your colors. And because they, they have different nutrients, only come from plants, we call phytonutrients, on top of the vitamins and minerals, now we know they are prebiotics as well. Different plants are different prebiotics and support different good guys, and that is the category of you know probiotics. This is the key. And so that it is the plate you really should think about. And as to put it all together, we should really focus on taking enough proteins, particularly from a high quality source, and with plenty vegetables and fruit. If you like whole grains, you can add whole grains, and they need to be well cooked so you can truly digest and really absorb it. And now, and I can't leave without talking about supplement. What is supplement? And I truly have to say, and supplement, it is mostly based on epidemiology studies, meaning population studies. And we know, we think we know what is good. For example, beta carotene, we know people eating a lot of carrots has a low uh, you know, incidence of lung cancer, even you smoking. But then we started to do clinical trials, give people beta carotene versus sugar pills. And guess what? Two years into it, we have to stop the trial that the lead center was the USC um, because we noticed the group taking beta carotene actually have more uh, people developing cancer. So why I'm saying that? Beta carotene is not carrots. And second point I want to make, when you take up a supplement, you take a one nutrient and come out of everything else, it is almost a drug, or I should say it's a drug. It has now is the issue of dose, and now you're talking about potential toxicity as well. If that does not uh, you know, make you worry, and the other worry is more than half of them may not have what you think it contains. I can only speak to one thing we have tested. We actually have student bought 30 top brand tea um, supplements. This is published as well. We found out of 30, only five contains anything, have anything to do with the tea. Rest of it really don't, okay? And so, um, you know, I'm not saying you should not take it, but here's I would recommend. Number one, if you can't eat your fruit vegetables, do that first. And that including raw and cooked. If you cannot do that, 
you can do things. Even you lose some nutrients and you losing a lot of uh, good things when you mix the oxygen, when you do the juicing, okay? That will be a second choice. You go, I even can't tolerate that. I'm going to take some supplement, okay? Then it is there. But I actually, because of all the natures I talked about, I don't recommend you take supplement during any of the treatment you go through with your oncologist. And, oh, and this is something I'm, I'm, I'm going to be more cautious than anything else. Lastly, I want to say, supplement, supplement to something. They cannot be what are you living on. I have a lot of patients say, I should be okay. I'm taking large dose of vitamins. They are supplements. They have to supplement to something. The main uh, uh, really building block for you is still the macronutrients and on top of that, vitamins and minerals. And there, our whole body is not, is all together. It's not just about what we eat. Also how we live. And stay active is another thing I really want to point it out. And the more you lay in bed, and the actually more function you're going to lose, and more tired you're going to feel, and even mentally feel more down. So stay active, particularly outdoors. Get out there. I'm not talking about this the time you push yourself or training for anything, but stay active and create a demand for your body. It is very essential to maintain your body function. And next one, it is we really need our sleep. Actually, when even our sleep cycle changes, the microbiome, the bacteria in our gut changes as well. And we actually also learned when you lack of sleep, there are tremendous impact on your immune system, and it may actually cause in, uh, inflammation out of itself. It doesn't matter what is there, and even, you know, you have pancreatic cancer. Try our best, rest well, and allow our body to recover. And lastly, and I know it's hard to do, and relax. And stress actually make everything on the edge, including our immune system. They are not able to function as well as they could. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>